Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How are you today, Bob? I am doing fine, Michael. How are you doing? I'm all good. We just got off the call with Nadia Balkin. We've got another two-part interview on its way, and we get into so much in this conversation. Oh, I would agree. We get, uh, we go, we cover everything from writing craft to superstition to tubing. So this is pretty good stuff. Yeah, don't forget the tubing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Clearly, an integral right part the of the two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get into the interview. Let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Edited by Daniel Kayaku with an introduction by Jonathan Mayberry. California Screaming peels back to sunshine and palm trees to expose the hidden darkness in the brutal heart of the Golden State. Forget sun beaches and shocker given surfers. Think eldritch river monsters and haunted ghost towns. California Screaming takes readers on a hellish road trip down the 101. From windblown deserts to the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains, E.S. McGill, Kevin Wetmore, Chad Stroop, Sarah Reed, Kevin David Anderson, and many more spin tales of terror that will make you rethink your next vacation. California Screaming is available in paperback and ebook October 22nd. So wax up your board and get ready to scream with 14 of the West Coast's finest authors. Coming October 5th, Deciduous Tales is a new literary journal featuring the very best in dark fiction. Join Richard Thomas, Matthew Brockmeyer, Douglas Milliken, Brian Asman, Josh Chaplinski, and more on a journey through the shadowy realms of literature. From horror and suspense to neo noir and transgressive, from classic creators to contemporary authors, Deciduous Tales is dedicated to highlighting the thought provoking, the scintillating, and the strange. Find out more at DeciduousTales.com or visit our Facebook page, Deciduous Tales, available October 5th. Get yours today. All right, and we're back, and I believe, Bob, that you have Nadia's bio. Yes. Born in Indonesia, Nadia Balkan spent half her childhood there and the other half in the U.S. Midwest. The author of numerous short stories, her work has been featured in several best-of anthologies, including the excellent anthology Creatures, edited by Paul Tremblay and John Langman, and Aikman's Heirs, and she is featured in the soon-to-be-released Tales from the Talking Board. Her first collection, she said Destroy, was recently released through Word Horde. Nadia currently resides in Washington, D.C. Okay, well, with that said, let's not mess around, let's do it. Let's get Nadia Balkin on the This Is Horror podcast. Let's do it. And now for a horror interview. Nadia, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I don't to begin with, if we could talk about what some of the important life lessons were that you learned growing up in Indonesia. Ooh, is this a serious, serious question or like sort of a comedic question? <laughs> because <laughs> there's two sets of answers here. With most of the questions, it's like, hey, it's interviewee discretion. So you take it okay. how you want. <laughs> if you really want to okay. treat the listeners, then give them the double experience, the serious okay. and the comedic. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Um, well, let's start with... Um, Actually, I'm not. I'm not sure whether I'm, this is going to be serious or comedic. Probably a little touch of both. But, okay. Um, I think that the, you know, sort of to, in the in the horror mindset, things that I learned were a lot of things that I learned, such as don't look behind you if somebody calls your name because it's probably a demon. You know, um, things like always make sure that if you're pregnant, you keep scissors under your pillow because a demon is going to try to, you know, kidnap your baby. Um, so there's sort of like those kinds of lessons that I learned. Um, you, you sort of turn into kind of a bit of a neurotic if you are already got a, a neurotic sensibility <laughs> living in Indonesia, because you think that uh, at every, every twist and turn, there's something out to get you. Um, on the other hand, I do think that the reason that, you know, these myths get, um, get told so often is because there is a real risk um, of, you know, a stranger abducting you or, you know, something along those lines. The same reason that myths get told and horror stories get told all over the world. It's to protect, protect kids from societal dangers. Um, so I think you also sort of learn to be, to be pretty watchful of your, of your whereabouts and all those kinds of things. You know, I, as I was a kid, I didn't, I didn't go around by myself. I didn't, um, 
certainly never traveled alone, all these sorts of things that I think kids growing up in the United States or European countries sometimes have a little bit more flexibility. Um, Indonesian kids don't, don't really have that sort of, that sort of freedom. Um, I guess so sort of on a more serious note, um, you learn things like if something terrible happens, um, such as for instance, you know, massive political upheaval or a riot or some kind of massive disruption to your daily life. It's just Indonesians tend to treat it as just a, just another sort of something that happens. Um, they don't get worked up over it. They don't get, you know, um, overly upset, overly afraid. And for instance, like there's, um, sometimes you get like these small bombs, small bombings, um, that are basically terrorist attacks, but quite small, um, and, you know, within a couple hours, you, you've got, like, saute vendors setting up right outside the scene of the crime, um, and everybody just sort of continues on as if normal, and, you know, you can see this sort of being, on the one hand, a very blasé reaction to, to something, something that should be, you know, maybe, maybe people should be paying a little more attention, but on the other hand, it's, it comes out of a, a desire to focus on survival and endurance, um, that's kind of the, I would say, the, the calling card of, of Indonesia, modern Indonesia, has been do whatever you can to survive. And, you know, there's something definitely to be said for internalizing that lesson. So mm. that's my answer to that. Wow, there's so many points that I could go from there. <laughs> and I think what I'd, I'd be interested to get into is, I mean, obviously there are a lot of demon myths and demon stories. Do you remember what the first demon myth was that you were told and who it was that told you that? So I guess your introduction mm. to demons and your reaction. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, gosh, I, I'm not sure about, you know, like the very first one, but it was probably the Kuntilanak. That's the name of the demon. Um, it's so famous that there's actually a city in Indonesia named after it. Because supposedly um, the guy who founded the city was killed by one. And so they, of course, you know, naturally decided to name the entire city after the demon. Right. Because that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, I would say, the most um, widespread demon myth um in indonesia there's also variants in malaysia and the philippines um so it's quite common all over southeast asia but basically it's the the ghost of a woman who dies in childbirth um where you get the differences is exactly sort of what she looks like um in the philippines for example i think she's a flying head um that has to like go back to her body at, at like during the daytime or something like that. And if you find the body and destroy it, then, you know, she's, she's vanquished in Indonesia. She's, um, she's like a beautiful woman who lures men, um, in particular, um, to their doom, obviously, because she, you know, this is one of those things where like, she looks really pretty and then you like approach her and, um, she's terrifyingly hideous. Um, which, you know, of course says something about how, you know, the role of women in society. Right. Um, but she also targets um, pregnant women because of the way that she died. Um, so, for instance, that's the, that's the scissors under the pillow myth. Um, supposedly, pregnant women, you know, have to, have to protect themselves because she has holes in the backs of her head. And so you, you get these scissors. And if, she, if you're, like, attacked by one in the middle of the night, you're supposed to stab her in the back of her head and like fill the hole and that is supposedly what will stop her or make her go away or something along those lines um but yeah that was definitely I guess the one that I was told most often honestly I was probably told it by a school teacher right. um my parents were not into making me scared like they that was not their like modus operandi as parents and they I think they thought it was all very ridiculous how much you know Indonesians do that to their children. Yeah. Um, but um, my school teachers did not feel the same way. Um, and as kids, we would like, for instance, they would, they'd be like, "Okay, well, we have some free time. It's Friday afternoon. Do you guys want to play outside, or do you want to hear a ghost story?" And we would all say, "Ghost story!" 
Um, so that's, you know, yeah, <laughs> we love ghost stories. And, and that was definitely, I would say, you know, the scariest one, the most popular one. Um, she was everywhere. Um, so yeah, I, in fact, I still sort of can't really, you know, I, I, I get scared thinking about it like as an adult. So <laughs> that is genuinely creepy. I mean, over here we have just like Bigfoot. But you've got you've got <laughs> right. a ghost. You've got a floating head ghost. Right. <laughs> and I'm still I'm still stuck on the first thing you said. If they say your name, don't look. You know, like don't look behind yeah. you. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, I mean, and you, you, you tell a kid that, and like it's like it's only going to make them more scared, right? Damn. I mean, <laughs> it's quite incredible. Um, but yeah, I, I I know a lot of a lot of people who like my childhood friends who. Maybe not when we were kids, because I left Indonesia when I was 11. But um, I would come back, and I remember my best friend said that, you know, would recounted all these stories about ghosts that she had seen, like, while in, in the time that I had been gone, which was, like, several years. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you are actually genuinely seeing these ghosts and demons? And she's like, oh, yeah. And, you know, had that that was... <laughs> It was a genuinely terrifying experience for her. And, you know, I don't know whether some of this is sort of like the power of societal suggestion or there's really something there. I mean, a lot of people will go there and will say, like, it feels like there is a different sort of energy in this country. Like even people who are sort of, you know, non-believers, I would say, like my mother, for instance, saw a ghost when she was in Indonesia and she's totally an atheist and totally a non-believer in like spiritual whatever but then you know she she doesn't like horror movies she you know refuses to talk about it really um mm. so I mean her story is in my opinion the creepiest um and it's partly because like I, I actually I, I truly believe her you know and like she's not the kind of woman who would just sort of say um, you know, who would be that susceptible to the power of suggestion? Um, so I can tell that story too, if you'd like. Oh, oh yeah. As soon as you said, hers is the creepiest, it's like, <laughs> well, we absolutely <laughs> have to get into that okay. then. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is like, you know, Indonesia Horror 101, I would say. There's no Kundalanak involved, but um, still, anyway. So. My mother uh, moves to Indonesia to teach English and to learn Javanese dance with a grad school friend. They move to a small village and they're living in this, um, they're renting this tiny bungalow, basically. There's only one bedroom. So um, her friend takes the bedroom and my mother is going to sleep in the living room. And... The friend is also sort of more of a hippy dippy sort of person, um, and so she decides that she is going to um, cleanse the little bungalow with a bunch of incense and stuff like that, which you know is already kind of a bad idea, right? Um, <laughs> um, and so that night, after everybody's gone to bed, um, my mother is woken up by this shaking of the bed and opens her eyes and sees a white pillar at the foot of the bed. And her instinct is to hide. <laughs> and it's like one of those things where like, you don't know what you're going to do, right, until you're in that moment. Um, and so she just covers, her, <laughs> covers, like pulls the covers over her head and just pretends it's not there right? Um, until the shaking goes away. And I think she also like kind of yelled at it or something like that. I, I'm, my memory's a little foggy on this, but I think she may have also sort of said like, go away or something like that. Um, and it never appeared again. So um, she, you know, she was kind of mad at her friend and said like, you know, your, your incense like woke up <laughs> like this thing. Um, but then it never appeared again. So, you know, it's fine. Um, they go their separate ways eventually um, travel around Indonesia and um, eventually find their way back to that first village that they, that they were in. And their friends, um, you know, take them out and they say, oh, well, you know, whatever happened to that little house that we used to live in, a little bungalow? And they said, oh, well, we tore it down. 
And they said, oh, okay. You know, and, and the friend said, well, you know, it turned out that the, the previous owner was buried under the house, under that room. So my mother believes that that's what she saw that night. Um, and that it was definitely, you know, disrupted by their presence. Um, but yeah, and it's very sort of like just, you know, there's no, there's no narrative sort of beginning or end. It just kind of was an incident. But for my mother, you know, who's like never seen anything since, you know, I don't think probably will ever see anything again. You know, that was like a defining sort of moment for her. And I remember that, you know, even though she is like a hardcore atheist and all these kinds of things, you know, she told me when I was little, like, to listen to um, my instincts um, when it comes to like places that were sort of had bad energy. And, you know, I, I didn't really know, have any idea really what she meant, but she was just like, just, you know, if you feel like a place is bad, just don't go in there. Mm. Um, and, you know, undefinable sort of feeling. Um, but the Indonesian word for that is anchor. Anchor, it means haunted, basically, but it also means something that's a little different from haunted because it means like, um, it's like haunted is like, there's like a, a certain particular ghost, right? That's like possessing the place. And Ankar is sort of like the whole place. There's just something wrong with the entire place. It's like a gateway. There's, you know, something. It's like, it's sort of more like um, Silent Hill, like hell level, you know? Mm. Like the whole thing is just fucked. Like just don't go in there. Um, and there's a lot of those kinds of like places that, you know, you just like kind of hear about. Um, and you're just sort of told like, oh, steer clear. You know, and everybody just kind of takes that at face value. Like nobody's like, oh, I'm going to be brave. And no, <laughs> there's no sort of like daredevil, you know, um, stuff. So, yeah. I'm going to have bad dreams tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so thank okay. you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> now a pillow at the end of the bed. Poof. Right, it's like the classic place for, you know, the ghost, right? Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I just feel like it has more credence just because my mother was, like, never into that kind of stuff, you know? So it's like, she's not, like, the kind of person who's, like, you know, grown up with it like me, you mm. know? Mm -hmm. I almost feel like if I saw a ghost, it would be, like, less believable for other people because I'm already, like, obsessed with horror and, like, <laughs> uh, all those things. I've never seen a ghost and don't want to, for the record. Let the record show. Yeah, so. just in case we have any ghosts or demons listening in. <laughs> now now you know. Well, no, thank you. Uh, we'll I'm have a visit scared. from the spectral presence. <laughs> right. You're, like, inviting something, you know. So, yeah. Well, that certainly lived up to what you said. That was a creepy story. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think... I mean, you were saying, like, a lot of people don't tend to then think, oh, I'll be brave and stay in the house. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. why, like, a lot of classic horror mm -hmm. movies, they either have slightly unrealistic or normally just incredibly naive characters. That's normally right. why the main characters right. have to be teenagers, because it's the only time <laughs> where you're like i'm just gonna do this incredibly stupid shit to impress right. <laughs> my mates right. and you right. know like if you're in your 30s or 40s or upwards it's like oh so there's this really haunted bungalow do you want to stay the night <laughs> no i fucking don't why the fuck would exactly. i want to do that i'm getting the fuck out of there <laughs> yes exactly Exactly. Well, and and, and yes. Indonesian horror movies are very similar. It's like they're only teenagers yeah. who are like doing the dare because anybody, and, and it's like a weekend, you know? But mm. like everybody else would be like, why? Why? <laughs> In God's name would I want to like try to communicate with the dead here? Like yeah. that just seems like a bad idea. Yeah. Usually at the beginning of any horror story, there's a bad decision. Mm. Yes. And yes. It's like if you don't have a bad decision, then you have a good decision. Then, you know, it's like if you're reading the book, then you're like, well, where's the rest of the book? This is the back cover. We're <laughs> Right. Right. That's no, I, I, I've <laughs> yeah. actually, 
talked about this with a roommate. Um, like, can we think of any single horror movie that doesn't start with a bad decision? Right. You know, or a decision that you then realize is bad. You know, like yeah. you may not know it's bad at the time, but you know, yeah. I, I guess one of the few movies where the characters are more realistic is Shaun of the Dead, where they're like, well, fuck yeah. this, let's go to the pub. <laughs> That's true. That's true. They don't make any bad decisions. That's partly why they survive, right? Because they, like, have the right instincts, kind of, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> Going to the pub, sort of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, well, doesn't, I it doesn't seem like a bad idea. It's like, right, look outside. <laughs> there's a load of zombies. There is a pub. We could have a lock-in. Yeah, yeah, definitely the pub. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think there has like, to be a way like to do it. Movies or zombie movies. If it's like a like an apocalypse, then it's like it's not your fault. Yeah. You know, I think it's like the ghosts and the demons. That's when it's like you're inviting that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> there needs to be a way that you could do like a ghost and demon story without a bad decision happening. And it, it just, it, it just, it seems like there should be a way to do it. But, you know, I mean, if you figure we got over a hundred years of movies and they haven't figured it out yet, so maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't no, know. It's, well, and like, I mean, part of what I, um, what I, what I, what I thought about is this idea that like you have to have trespassed some kind of boundary, right? Mm -hmm. In order to like violate, you know, in order to like basically be punished, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's like a societal boundary, like in the sort of, you know, Halloween style, or whether it's like, literally, you're like, I need to talk to my dead relative. And so I'm going to do this ritual. That is a bad idea, you know, but I'm so desperate in my grief. Um, or, you know, you take a wrong turn somewhere in a road, you know, whatever it is, it seems like you have to have done something to violate a norm. Yeah. And then you, know, you, you pay the price, right? Right. And that's like, I don't know, kind of kind of a major sort of component of horror stories, I feel. Yeah, and particularly yeah, with yeah. demons, I mean, even yeah, though totally. you, you, you don't see demons as uh, the most moral and ethical creatures, they do have their own kind of code of morality, so you have to right. do something to cross it if you're... Right behaving in a way that is okay with the demon then you know you're not going to invoke them right it's, you know, don't play with the ouija board right and i think i think there's a certain mm -hmm. element of like we want we like that kind of structure because it makes you feel like well if i just obey the rules i'll be okay yeah you know so like these guys kind of have have it coming right because they fucked up in some way and I think, you know, that's like, that's like the typical experience of like watching a horror movie in theaters is like, you get all the people screaming, like, don't go in there. Like, you know, clearly that's a bad idea. Like move out of the house, you know? So it's just like, ah, these people are stupid. You know, it's, it's almost like you, you like want like stupid characters because that's like the only way it goes back to like the whole idea of staying in the house. Right. Mm. Like when you know, there's like something there. Yeah. Like Why? I mean, and then what happens is you have like the non-believer, you know, the hero type. I'm not afraid of the ghost. I'm going to go in there. Y'all ain't right. going to worry about nothing. And the next thing you know, just like the ghost throws his, you know, decapitated yeah. head out <laughs> on the lawn. And the other, everyone else is like, oh, shit, we're going to die. You know? Right. You, you exacerbated it. Right. Yeah. You made it worse. Yeah. yeah and they're like, you challenged it. <laughs> right. And you right. died. <laughs> right. It's like it's like it encourages us to be to play by the rules, to be humble in the face of the unknown, you know, to recognize like your own like your place and your place is not to challenge, you know, scary, monstrous things. It's 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 really interesting, like what horror sort of teaches you in that in that traditional sense. Yeah. It could be broken down through society. I mean, it's just uh, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that about horror, but it's so, like, you can tell so much about a society by, like, the kinds of horror stories it tells, you know? Mm. Right. I mean, Bob, you said that the unbeliever might go in, but I, I'm, I'm still going to argue that it does take a, a kind of stupidity or naivety or a combination of the two, because 
as you know, I'm an atheist, but that, that just means at the moment that the evidence and the experience I've had means that I don't believe there's anything that is suggesting God is real, but I certainly don't claim to have <laughs> knowledge of everything. And hey, if the evidence we're presented with is that bad shit is happening, I'm not going in right. that room. <laughs> right. Well, and also like Feast did the opposite of that, where you have like this hero type believer dude who goes into the bar and tells everyone that they're coming, the monsters are coming. And he dies too because he told them the truth. So, you know, that's it's it's an interesting little 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 trope there. Mm. Mm-hmm. But Nadia, you said that you were in Indonesia until you were eleven years old. At what at, yep. at that point you moved to America. To, so I did. I mean yes. That must put you in quite a unique position to have had half of your childhood in Indonesia and the other half in America. So I'm wondering, with both countries, what are some of your best and worst memories of living there? Mm. Well, hmm. I would say, well, you know, I mean, they kind of have like similar... They're, they're strangely similar in some ways. Both countries are um, sort of conservative, um, like both Nebraska and Indonesia, like Jakarta, um, are conservative societies. Um, and, in, you know, a little bit sort of insular. Um, so, like, for instance, when I was a kid in Indonesia, I always looked and was perceived to be more... Um, foreign than everybody else because I'm, I'm half, half Indonesian and um, white American. Mm. Um, and then when I was in Nebraska, I was of course perceived as to be more foreign than everybody else there. You know, so you know, regardless, it's it was very much like a I was always on the outside looking in, um, sort of in both places. Um, but you know, yeah, both sort of like conservative, family-oriented cultures in that sense, quite similar religious um of course different religions um but uh, you know again a tradition that i wasn't a part of in both senses um i mean i think i think my my answer to that is probably a function of like how old i was you know like when i was a child in indonesia i think i i had a pretty a pretty good childhood you know my parents were happy, you know, raised me well. I don't have any kind of weird, you know, skeletons in the closet. Um, loved going on vacations to the beach, you know, all that was all very good. Um, the ghost stories were a little scary, obviously. The, I was, you know, probably the worst part of it is something that I wasn't really aware of, which was that I was living in a dictatorship. <laughs> mm. um, but when you when you don't have any context on that kind of thing, you just see it as like, oh, we had another election, there's a major violence. I guess I'm going home because there's too much violence. So like we, you know what I mean? Like we would all be sent home on election day because everybody, and it was like on clockwork because everybody knew there were going to be riots. And so send the kids home, you know, like we, we were, we'd be like, Oh, it's election day. We're going to go home soon. Um, that was like our context, um, of a political change. And then it was like, but the same thing always happened. And the same guy always was president. So it was like, oh, okay. Like, I guess that's just how the world works. Um, and I, I mean, I, I had a concept of elections because my mother would vote in American elections, for instance. Um, but I, I just figured, well, I guess in America, you know, they change them out because they don't like that guy anymore. And in Indonesia here, you know, we everybody still likes Suharto. <laughs> so that's why he keeps getting reelected. Um so they you should change you know, them out. It just didn't happen that often. It <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was very much a rubber stamp election. Like my mm-hmm. father was, you know, his votes were monitored. You know what I mean? And he worked for like a university, so like that was obviously he couldn't vote like sort of the way he really wanted to vote. Um. So a lot of the stuff that was like the bad aspects of the dictatorship were very much concealed um, from the public and from, I mean, I would say from the, from the, you know, the ch- from children is what I would say. Like the adults knew about this stuff and 
you know, you would hear like sort of like your parents whispering at night, sort of, you know, using kind of code words, um, for instance, like tapol, which means um, political prisoner. Um, Indonesians abbreviate their words. Um, they smash them together. It's like tahanan politik becomes tapol. And so like you can kind of whisper about these things without actually having to say the entire sort of inflammatory word. Um, but it was a very successful dictatorship in that sense that it was like totally in control of, you know, everything just had, had, had like enough flexibility to accommodate the occasional political protest, um, to sort of give the illusion of choice, um, without actually having to really accommodate very much at all. Um, so, you know, I didn't see things that were, that were the bad things. Um, that was all kept very much like swept under the rug. Um, but that was definitely, I would say, you know, in hindsight, like the worst part of living there was mm. was growing up in that sort of society, obviously. Um, and Nebraska, um, well, the worst part of Nebraska, probably just the insular nature of it. Um, but, you know, just kind of monotonous, you know, undiverse <laughs> location um, and society. Um it's sort of, I you know, I, I obviously have a have a fond a fondness for Nebraska because I spent my high school and junior high years there, but it's become sort of I would say increasingly strained um, as I've gotten older and sort of lived in I've lived in New York and Washington post that you know and you know I think you know don't want to get into politics here but like obviously people know that the United States is undergoing a bit of a cultural crisis you know I would say and you can really sort of feel um the divergence between sort of the the coasts and and the and the center so it's it's interesting being from from the center and then you know moving out to to DC um I mean it's the difference is 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 so extreme in in how people sort of live so yeah I have very mixed feelings now about Nebraska but you know, it was, it was a good experience as, you know, just kind of like as a, as a kid, you know, safe, obviously all that kind of bullshit that you want for your kid. Mm. <laughs> so. How long have you been in DC and what brought you there? Um, well, I've been in DC for how many years now? Since 2011. So however many years that is, <laughs> yeah. I guess that's six. <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> like doing math ah. yeah um we need to put Dremblay here <laughs> yeah right exactly um, ah, math. No. i know right <laughs> um so i was a political science major in undergrad and i came here for grad school um to do international politics um just because i that was you know what i studied and i figured there's, there's not really any many many places to go if you've got sort of a international relations background and you want to make a living out of that then sort of dc new york and maybe california but um dc is definitely the the hub for that so that's what brought me out here and that's what i do now mm. um so yeah and your writing is socio-political horror is that something right. that you started while you were taking your ba in political science or did your story writing Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I, I mean, I, so I started writing, like I've been writing since I was like a kid. Right. Like, I mean, obviously like uh, probably a lot of writers are like that too. Like they scribble in their little notebooks, you know, like half finished paragraph stories that aren't really anything. Um, but I've been doing that since I was like, before I could, you know, write really myself. Um, when I still had my mother dictating, dict like I would dictate stories to my mother. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, my, my family was, was pretty political, I would say. Um, and I think the fact that like, um, everything that happened in Indonesia in 1998 really sort of, um, kicked off a sense of, you know, political awareness for me. Um, just because I, you know, in case people aren't familiar, that was the year that everything came crashing down for the dictatorship that we were all living in. Um, and, there was just this huge sort of like moment of change and um, chaos and suddenly politics was everywhere. 
when it had been concealed, like very, very deliberately concealed. Um, and suddenly it was like everybody had a political opinion. Everybody wanted like freedom and independence and um, a voice and a vote. Um, so it was, it was, you know, a huge catalyst of change. And it really, I, I learned only after my father died that same year um, that he had been involved in politics himself, that he had been a critic of the regime. Um, like these were all things that were kept very, very hidden from me. Um, so I had, you know, a major sort of like political awakening moment um, when I was around 11 or so. And so it's always been something that I was, that I became fascinated by. Um, so I think it's always sort of had, you know, found its way into my writing for that reason. And that's the reason I, I majored in political science was because I wanted to understand how, you know, how power works, um, how societies work. That's kind of at the, the kernel at the heart of political science. Um, because I had been subject to this like huge disruptive change. Um, and also I think probably cause I was trying to get close to my dad. Um, because I knew that that was I, I I knew after the fact that that was his his sort of great passion in life. Um, so yeah, I think my writing's always been always had a little bit of touch of that in it. Um, and I think as I got older, the more I sort of said, you know what, I really feel like this is what I wanted. I want to push my writing in this direction um, and see sort of where I, you know how far I can go with it. Um, of course, it's always tricky to sort of be like trying to write like that because you don't want to be accused of being preachy or being, you know, I mean, nobody likes to read like an overtly political screed, right? It's like, that's like the worst thing you can, you can do. And it's like, you know, like counterproductive. Like if you're trying to like, you know, sway somebody to a particular cause, it's like the worst thing you can do is to be really obvious about it. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that that's like necessarily what I'm trying to do. I think it's more like I just write with those themes. Um, I'm, I'm, I sort of liken it to like, I love, for instance, um, post-apocalyptic movies that really build up their worlds in a really interesting way that show like how society actually functions now. Like how do people survive, you know, some cataclysmic event um like a monster you know monsters like coming out of you know the space or the water or whatever like economy survives you know like society survive so like i love it when there's sort of that element of like you know you can see like for instance in the movie monster monsters yeah monsters um i can't remember it's, it's the one that's set in mexico but you have this whole thing of like you see people's daily lives and you see like the sort of economy that's that's developed around um, the around these monsters and around like the the gates you know that fence them off and you see like the commercials and the sort of like like public service announcements like you know don't go near the monsters you know and it's like you really see like all of this like how how it all shifts the society which you know like that's really what I'm more interested in rather than like pushing a particular opinion because I think you know if you like the most like the best thing you can do is kind of project the truth and, and let your reader sort of make their um, conclusions on their own so yeah I just like to sort of see I always like to put things in societal context I guess is what I would say and that's sort of what I, all I'm trying to do mm. yeah it seems like you uh, really touched on that like in the five stages of grief mm -hmm. where you have yeah. this you have this uh, apparently this event that occurred right and we're seeing it from a different perspective we're seeing it from a perspective that you wouldn't normally see it from uh which kind of you know kind of it definitely tips the scale on it being you know something that you you know like, like they always say avoid what's been done to death and uh and this is like totally fresh it's totally different it's uh it's it it comes out of left field, but you, at the same time, you know where it's coming from. And, uh, so, I mean, I totally get where you're coming from. This is, a, you know, it's an incredible story. Uh, I just, I, I, I love that shift in perception mm -hmm. and not, not really, mm -hmm. it's not really, it's more than that. It's a shift in perspective as well. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, me too. I, I think that that's like one of the best things you can do as a, or like one of the most fun things you can do as a writer, you know, is like, you know, you know, like the, where, like, typically if you like lay out the story, you know, like this is going to be told by character A and this is like all these things are going to happen in this sequence. And that's, you know, what the lesson that's going to be learned at the end. And I love that horror is so, you know, like flexible and that you can, you can twist like the, the order of things around. You can make them learn a different lesson. You can, um, you can tell it from the perspective of a totally different character. Um, so like actually in the first story, um, in she said, destroy inner tropical convergence zone, you know, that's a story that like normally you would tell from the perspective of the victim, you would tell from the perspective of like someone who is trying to fight the injustice, right? Um, you would not tell it from the perspective of somebody who is committing these things in the name of good. Um, but like, that's what's more interesting, right? It's like, yeah, you know the victim story. You know like why someone would try to fight um, some you know terrible, um, terrible government or whatever. But like, what about the person that is part of the system and is supporting it? but is ostensibly still a moral person, you know, like that's more interesting and that's more, you know, psychologically horrific. Um, so yeah, like I always try to like, try to put it in a unusual perspective or a perspective that doesn't get told as much because mm -hmm. yeah, it's just more fun that way. <laughs> is that like an initial focus? Like, you know, you get the yeah. idea, and then you then you immediately begin to well, okay. Well, who who who's whose version of this is going to be the most fucked up but fun to write? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I mean, and I, I always have to keep in mind, like, okay, does this person die at the end? Because like, is this going to be told from beyond the grave, kind of thing, right? Like, you know, right. <laughs> you know, it's always you have to be a little, you know, touchy with that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's that's always one of my first um, first decisions. Is like, and, and, and a lot of times it is sort of like, who would normally tell the story? And then like, is it better told from somebody else's perspective? Um, but, you know, at the same time, like, you know, I kind of uh, abide by the, the principle that you should try to try to keep it as close to the heart of, you know, what's going on. So, you know, that limits you a little bit. Um, but I, I like to sort of have characters that are a little bit complicit and a little bit guilty um mm -hmm. not necessarily like evil characters like i'm not sure i've ever written a story from a character like perspective of a character i would classify as just like unrepentantly bad but somebody who's like not this sort of like paragon of purity and innocence you know like that's boring right like who right like, it's unrelatable and it's, you know, unrealistic. And it's also just not interesting because the only thing that can happen to them in a horror story is basically either they get corrupted, which, okay, that's something, or they die <laughs> or they watch something else happen. You know I mean? It's just like, mm -hmm. what's the point there? Like you need to be a little bit somebody who gets their hands dirty. So. Right. I've, I've always hated that. You know, the, the, the big hero type, the blonde hair, sweet blonde hair, he rides a horse. I'm like, man, <laughs> this guy, it's like he's too fucking perfect. Can he have like B.O., <laughs> like halitosis, something, a hangnail? I mean, fuck. Yeah. I'm pissed off at the world, you know? Right. Of and course. It's like, so you, you write in those shades, it, it, you, you got to kind of dig into the shades of gray to find Absolutely. really interesting characters that people can relate to still, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think that horror is actually really awesome for that, you know? I think that, like, that's part of the reason that I always felt more at home in horror than in fantasy, for instance, which I sort of tried to write a little bit when I was first starting to publish, um, was that, like, I felt like um, in fantasy you have to really, like, try to, like, not make, like, terrible one-dimensional characters that are, like, these sort of heroic tropes because that's, like, your archetype um, that you're working with in the genre. But horror is, like you know, I mean, like, like we said earlier, right, you want stupid characters <laughs> who, like, make bad decisions. You right. want, like, you want me, so, like, you're either stupid or they're, like, evil, or they're just, like, wounded, like, grievously wounded that has, like, screwed up their sense of, like, reason and rationale. And, like, you definitely, I mean, like, I love that about horror, and it's, you know, the fact that, like, 
you've got these like fucked up characters that are then making fucked up decisions and usually ending up in the worse place like than they were before um, mm-hmm. is something that is immensely appealing to me, which probably says something about me. Um, but <laughs> I think there's enough people that also sort of look for that, frankly. And I think to see it as sort of like vaguely therapeutic um, as I always did, you know, like I couldn't relate to the struggles of some like perfect you know, perfect character who's like super strong and super smart and super beautiful and just has to overcome some, you know, dragon. Like, mm, like I don't, what's, what's comforting about that? You know, like it's more comforting to like follow the struggles of some like Mm -hmm. washed up, you know, whatever. (laughs) Someone who's like made poorer decisions than even you have. Yeah. And, And see if they can overcome because if if that's if you know if if they're like and then like they're having to go up against some like demon in their house i'm thinking of like the pact for instance like a recent-ish horror movie and mm-hmm. like if they can get through that then like fuck like you should be thankful that like your life isn't that bad you know and even if they can't right. get through that still be thankful that your life isn't that bad like though like i i usually find like the worst mood that i'm in the more i'm like i need to watch a horror movie and just like <laughs> put myself in perspective, right? <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's gotten to the point to where if I read about like the, the shining white, you know, hero, that mm-hmm. <clears throat> I, I immediately begin to lose interest. If I write that particular character, that's a victim. It's, you know. Yeah. Oh, a, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, right. Right. Usually, and usually by direct, you know, directly from you know, the major conflict, whatever, whatever right. it is, ghostly, whatever, another human, uh, because that's just realistic, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like, because our, our greatest, our greatest heroes that have ever walked the face of the earth are some of the most complicit and flawed human beings that have ever right. also, you know, so, I mean, it, it's no one's perfect. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, yeah, and you see that repeat itself in history time and time again. Um, Mm -hmm. And we we sort of sanitize all our heroes, right? So that, like, when little kids get to learn about them, they only learn, like, the positive stuff. But no human is like that. (laughs) Like, (laughs) Like, there is no human on Earth that is that perfect. And if they are, you know, frankly, they probably haven't gotten themselves into a place where they're doing anything interesting with their lives, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so they're not in a position to really be some big hero anyway. Um, yeah, so I completely agree. So we've been speaking a lot about flawed characters and flawed people, people who certainly have a sense of morality but are complicit in evil and in making poor choices. What mm-hmm. do you think makes someone a monster? Where is the line? Oh, uh, sort of between like just complicit and like a monster. Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, disclaimer, everyone's answer to this is probably going to be going to reflect like their view of like morality. Right. I, I tend to think that there is, like, we're, there's, okay, here's what I would say. Like, most people, I would say, are complicit. There's probably, like, 10% of people that are, like, pure-hearted and incomplicit, or whatever the word would be. And then there's, like, the rest of people are the, the sort of purely evil folks. But I don't think there's a lot of those people. I think a lot of people are just making weak decisions that, you know, basically save their skins in the short term. Um, I think that, you know, true sort of like malice is rare. Um, And maybe that's, you know, naivete on my part, but I think that most terrible things that, that happen happen because of some, something less than like pure evil, you know, like that doesn't mean the thing, the action isn't terrible. I think, I think people can do a lot of monstrous things but that doesn't necessarily make them monsters in a various, in an essential sense, you know? Um, 
so I guess you know what what would make him like a true monster is I think I think you got to have an understanding of that you're doing something malicious and hurtful um, and you're doing it anyway. I think that's that's a huge part. Um, and you're doing it even though you don't have to, you know, like you have options and you're choosing to do something that you know is going to cause like massive harm to others. I think that's, um, that's a lot of it. And I think, and the reason I say like, you know, the choice is because I think a lot of people feel like they don't have a choice, right? Like for whatever reason, um, be it sort of mental health or they're being threatened by the mob or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, they feel like they're, they've been put into a corner and now they just have to do this terrible thing. Um, and, you know, I don't classify those people as, as monsters necessarily. I think that they, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from um, the song Courage um, by the Tragically Hip. And it's, um, it talks about, um, hang on, let me, let me find the lyric because it is awesome. Okay. But basically it is, um, yeah, the human tragedy consists in um, the necessity of living with the consequences. And I think that so many times, like, monstrous things are that, you know, it's just, it's, it's a tragedy in the sense that you are being forced to live with the consequences of some, you know, circumstance or whatever that you've been, you know, pushed into. And I think, you know, in that sense, the world is very monstrous. And people are very, like, you know, do monstrous things. But I, you know, again, I don't think that's the same as, like, being a monster. So, like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't consider myself personally a monster. <laughs> um, I'm sure I've done monstrous things. Um, so, like, I don't know if I could ever really, like, write a character who I would say is just, like, unrepentantly, or, like, from the perspective of a character who's just, like, a monster. You know, I don't know if I could. I've never tried. So maybe that's a project that I should try. But I'm not sure I could do it believably. You yeah. Know? Yeah, well, I think that's the thing, just like we were saying, there's no such thing really as the absolute perfect hero. I'm not sure mm -hmm. there's such a thing as an unadulterated evil villain. You know, that there's right. always something, e even if it's like, well, you know, Hitler, he liked dogs. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't really doesn't really remedy right. things but you can you can find no. something you can find a, a commonality or a human characteristic right right and i think i think that's kind of like what you know the reason that we have demons at all right is, and we always say like the ghost is the is is the remnant of a, of a human right and in that sense even if it's like the worst ghost ever like a really really angry ghost you know like it still had a human soul at some point but a demon you know that's that's like when that's when you're like you're really screwed because like that shit is like it never had any sort of you know sense or sympathy for you um so you know yeah anyway but yeah i completely agree mm -hmm. <laughs> and i think it's also just like it's like our tendency or our desire to to see sort of some kind of like purely evil thing it's like well, that's convenient because it separates, like, it sort of, like, makes you think, well, I'm not that, so, like, I must be, like, better, you know, but I think that's, that's a false dichotomy, you know, I think, I think the more that we can sort of say, like, sort of separate out essentially evil people and all that kind of stuff, the more we sort of don't have to look at ourselves and the evil things that we might be doing, mm -hmm. because we just say, oh, that person's totally just a bad apple, you know. And it keeps us from looking at ourselves as potentially bad apples or as at like our society is something that it may have created bad apples. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would agree. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, you can't have somebody who is, you know, completely evil. They turn into like a Dr. Evil character. Right. You know? And so, you know, but didn't you said that they have like a certain percentage of people? And I believe that there's a certain percentage of the human population that is one flat tire. I'm late to work and I don't feel good away from losing their fucking minds. 
And yeah. I want to that's that's the that's the character that interests me the most. Of course. Yeah. You know, because they're they're because they're relatable and you right. can do, there's so much you can do the world is just like, it's wide open, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um because we all we all make terrible choices and we all have negative emotions, right, that we like sometimes come to. Um Exactly. And I I you know I, I'm very thankful, honestly, that horror is has like creates a place for that. For people to like be angry and to be sad, you know, and to like be grieving for months and years on end and to think that like if only I could, you know, talk to my dead relative, you know, that would make it easier. Um yeah, I love that. I love that it's like the realm of like the fucked up. Um because I think I think people who need it, who need to like hear that the most, you know, like um, or like, I don't know, like, I think, I think as someone who's like struggled with, um, depression, um, basically all my life, you know, that's something that is definitely, um, a comfort is like knowing that other people, you know, also struggle in the darkness against demons, internal and external. Right. So it's, it's much more interesting. Oh Yeah. What are some of the things you've done to try and manage your depression or to navigate living with depression? Um, I mean, writing is a huge part of it, honestly. Um, and I think you would probably hear the same from a lot of writers who have those issues. Um, obviously, it's a way to sort of work out your feelings and to, and to, to find some kind of meaning in your life. Um, writing is a huge part of that to make meaning. Um, I think it's always useful. I always, you know, sort of say I haven't written in like however many weekends I really need to take a writing break and I really need to like get into that space. So that's one. Um, obviously I'm a huge advocate of, um, of therapy, honestly. Um, I think people don't, people have sort of stigma about it still. Um, I think it's gotten better with time, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very anti stigma. Yeah. <laughs> That's in that sense. Um, obviously my father died when I was, um, when I was little. And so I've had a, I've had years of experience in, you know, grief therapy. Um, and honestly, you know, group grief therapy is like the most awesome thing. It's, which is what I was doing in college. Um, we had like a little group for like um, kids who had lost a parent. And a lot of us had lost their, our parents, you know, a long time ago, um, some more recent, but it was like just a place where people could say um, the things that, you know, even the irrational, stupid, or, you know, angry things that they were thinking and other people would relate to them. And listen to them. And, um, I think that's a huge part of it is just like, you know, the human desire to be understood and listened to, um, is something that I think we sometimes struggle with a bit as a society. Um, and, you know, I think that's for a lot of people, that's, that's really like what the purpose of therapy serves is like, just, you know, to feel like they're not alone. Um, so, yeah, I can't can't advocate for that enough. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. We haven't spoken much about group therapy. I mean, we've spoken a little bit before about, yeah, I guess more traditional one-on-one -on -one therapy, but I can certainly see how having that group surrounding you who have gone through similar things or even things that have commonalities but are quite different makes you feel, you know, that little bit less alone. Right. It's like the shared experience, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously I don't have experience with this particularly, but, like, people who are alcoholics and all that stuff, you know, I know that that's a huge part of, a huge part of that kind of group therapy for a reason. Um, yeah. Because... And and it's like you sort of keep each other on the on the on the like road to recovery too, right? You're sort of like accountable to other people, which I think is huge. Like, and that's part of, I think for me at least, is like you're accountable to your therapist, 
you know, you're accountable to like the person who's trying to help you. Um, it's really interesting how that, <laughs> how that works. Um, but yeah, I mean to, you know, sort of bring it back to, to horror, you know, I think that that's that in a lot of ways, horror is like group therapy, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's, that's, you know, that's why, for instance, like I love when I find good movies or good horror stories that, um, that have to do with grief and have to do with loss, um, which is a very common theme in horror, you know, I think for a reason. Um, but when you find like the really good stuff, it, it can be, it's, it's really, it's really therapeutic to sort of see somebody work out those, those things and to be able to say, yeah, I've gone through that too. I'm not alone. Um, and you know, you just hope that you don't, you don't make the, the terrible decisions that they do. Um, mm. but yeah, it's interesting how many horror movies really sort of like focus on like, don't try to like revive your dead relative. Right. right. <laughs> like, and, and, and it's very explicitly like, you know, like Pet cemetery style, like <laughs> don't, don't literally bring them back to life or like, don't even talk, try to talk to them. And it's, it's so much like, like, what is that saying about like, how we understand grief, right? It's like, don't hang on to the past. Don't linger there, you know? Um, because if you sort of dwell in this sort of negative space, you might invite other things, you know? And even in a horror story, it's it's like you are inviting other demons or whatever, you know, things that aren't your relative. Um, but like in real life, it might be like you are inviting some other, you know, any, you know, addiction or something like that, you know, to come into your life um, by sort of living in the dark space of, you know, dwelling on your, on your loss. Um, so it's like, it's, I'm always fascinated by that sort of how, how stories are structured that way. Like so many horror stories are, are around these like, you know, grieving parents, for instance, that, you know, can't move on and are just, you know, willing to do anything to like, have have just another sort of touch, you know, of their of their dead child, for instance, and it's. I mean, yeah, I, I've never gone through that, you know, and to be honest, I I also don't have any sort of great desire to contact my dead father, um, but it's interesting how many times that that story repeats, in yeah. in horror lore. It, I mean, it does come up a lot, and I'm like you. I don't want to talk to anybody who that I've you know known and loved that's passed away because I I got a feeling that if I spent all that time and if I could really do it and if I actually could talk to them, they'd be you know the first thing that they would say. Like if I could talk to one of my good friends that passed away years and years ago, he'd say, "What are you doing?" Right. Well, I mean, seriously, dude, what what are you doing? Because I, I'm not really going to be able to help you with anything. <laughs> yeah yeah so you have needed you seen, to have move you seen on room 104 <laughs> huh sorry what was what was that have you seen room 104 no the i've HBO heard about show? it i want to see it. it's on hbo right yeah yeah there's an episode that deals exactly with what you're talking about i i won't spoil it for you but it's exactly that and it's it's really quite um sort of funny and heartfelt so check it out yeah definitely but i think there's a there's a film that's that's out now i haven't seen it yet i want to it's called a dark song uh, uh yes i was just about and to it, go there and they it, that, but i believe that's the premise <clears throat> is it is the premise she wants to yes. reach out and yes. I, you know i'm reading the synopsis for this and as soon as they say you know the, you know someone who's you know i guess an occult an occultist you know and of course, mm -hmm. my mind's like, "Oh, good! That means something's gonna go wrong," you know, <laughs> because magic yeah. never works yeah. the way you want it to. Right. So I want to see no, it. I just a, haven't seen it yet. It's a great movie. It's really, really good, and it's so well done in that sense, exactly. Of like, um, I mean, a I would say it's interesting because I think it doesn't go exactly as you would predict it would go. Like the movie, not the magic, but well, yeah, and the magic. Um. But B, it's like such a great meditation on like um, on grief and on like the desire for vengeance, um, on forgiveness, like all these like, you know, the things that like the real emotions that one goes through, you these know, big themes. Yeah, really, really big themes. And it, it doesn't 
in my opinion, extremely well. Like I, I watched it and I was like genuinely moved by the entire thing. It was really well done. So <laughs> it's on yeah, Netflix. I have it saved. I just haven't watched it yet. And it's, I, I'm so stupid. I should just watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I might watch it again after this. <laughs> now that you put me in the mindset for it. <laughs> have you seen it yet, Michael? I haven't. Did you say it's called A Dark Sung? Is that right? Yeah, right, A Dark on, Sung. It's on Netflix. And yeah, it's on Netflix. It's... Well, yeah, I, I haven't watched it, but I'm sold. I'll probably watch it this <laughs> evening. Yeah, I know. I think I'm going to watch it later on tonight. But, I mean, I can't. I have to get up so early in the morning because we have inventory. Yes. Mm. My life sucks right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to our podcast with Nadia Bolkin. If you want to hear the second part of the conversation right away, then become our Patreon at the $4 or above level, and you can head over to www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror right now and hear the full conversation. There are also a number of perks at different levels, such as the $1 level that gives you early bird access to every podcast and the ability to submit a question for our guest. Of course, if you don't have the financial means to support us on Patreon, then I really hope you'll join us next time for part two of the interview. We've got a lot of exciting episodes coming up. Today, we recorded an interview with SP Miskowski. In a couple of days, we'll be talking to Alan Baxter, and we've also got a podcast lined up with Matt Cardin. Before I wrap up, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Edited by Daniel Kayaku with an introduction by Jonathan Mayberry. California Screaming peels back to sunshine and palm trees to expose the hidden darkness in the brutal heart of the Golden State. Forget Sundridge beaches and shocker given surfers. Think Eldritch River monsters and haunted ghost towns. California Screaming takes readers on a hellish road trip down the 101. From windblown deserts to the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains, E.S. McGill, Kevin Wetmore, Chad Stroop, Sarah Reed, Kevin David Anderson, and many more spin tales of terror that will make you rethink your next vacation. California Screaming is available in paperback and ebook October 22nd. So wax up your board and get ready to scream with 14 of the West Coast's finest authors. Coming October 5th, Deciduous Tales is a new literary journal featuring the very best in dark fiction. Join Richard Thomas, Matthew Brockmeyer, Douglas Milliken, Brian Asman, Josh Chaplinski, and more on a journey through the shadowy realms of literature. From horror and suspense to neo-noir and transgressive, from classic creators to contemporary authors, Deciduous Tales is dedicated to highlighting the thought-provoking, the scintillating, and the strange. Find out more at DeciduousTales.com or visit our Facebook page, Deciduous Tales, available October 5th. Get yours today. I'd like to finish with a quote from Lawrence Block, and Lawrence Block has so many great books on writing, on the craft of writing. He wrote a column for Writer's Digest for years, and he's one of the masters of crime fiction. And this is the quote. One thing that helps is to give myself permission to write badly. I tell myself that I'm going to do my five or ten pages no matter what and that I can always tear them up the following morning if I want. I'll have lost nothing. Writing and tearing up five pages would leave me no further behind than if I took the day off. And that was Lawrence Block. So go easy on yourself. Give yourself permission to write badly. But do right. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror, and have a great, great day.